Okay, so yes, welcome everybody. This is the uh, virtual lunch and learn on Silicon uh, PM technology explored. I'm David Brown, I'm the host today. Excited to have you all here to explore this new and exciting technology. I'm joined by Paul Shatanis. Paul is the CEO and technical director for Psionics Holland. Psionics is a worldwide manufacturer of scintillation detectors and a, a very well known leader in new materials and new designs. This company has been in this business uh, 25 years and uh, has experience in every, all over the world. Uh, I'm also joined today by uh, Vincent Osario, who is the uh, managing partner at Brightspec in Belgium. Uh, Brightspec is a younger company, uh, about eight years old, and is uh, highly focused on X-ray and nuclear spectroscopy systems, both electronics and software. Um, they have engineers that have many, many years of history working in other companies, and I think they're, they're doing the most advanced work in this field today. I'm going uh, quick little number of housekeeping items. Uh, we will keep the participants muted until the end when we we'll try again to have sort of an open discussion. Uh, the Q&A box is live and we will uh, answer all the questions that are in the Q&A box uh, as well as the audio recordings that have been dropped in there now. Uh, but that those answers may come privately after the event is over. The chat box is not private, so if you have sensitive material, please save that for a later conversation. Uh, the entire presentation is not classified. We will provide a um, the documentation that's being shown to you and a link to a, a recording as well uh, after the event. And uh, if you have a full screen button uh, in your in your window, I would recommend using that. You'll have the best experience for the webinar. Uh, the webinar, we're going to try to keep it to an hour. The agenda is uh, first touch on certain, certain current options for light detection, uh, briefly on some of the other existing technology, and of course, jumping right into the silicon photomultipliers. We're going to have uh, Paul's going to share about advancements in recent years uh, for photomultipliers. Also, considerations between silicon photomultipliers and PMTs, which is the big question here today. And then uh, Vincent will uh, share some of his advancements in signal processing electronics and what he's able to do uh, to make the total package a better solution. We'll get to take a look at some of his spectrum analysis software and measurement results. Again, I think his company is on the front edge of uh, design and uh, engineering in this space and then have a quick Q&A session if time permits. Okay, moving forward. Uh, we'll ask the, the, the million dollar question for Paul. Can silicon photomultipliers replace vacuum PMTs? And welcome, Paul. Thanks very much, David. I'm very glad to be here today. And it's a very interesting question that we have put on the table today. And I will try to give you today a very practical approach and show you where we are uh, with this answer this question and show you examples of what we can really do these days with silicon PMs in scintillation light detection. So the subject actually is advances in scintillation light detection. And we have a range of possibilities for scintillation light detection, like the classic for mobile air tubes and some model technologies, which I will go into in a few moments. An interesting remark I would like to make first is that silicon technology allows us to detect higher wavelength emitting light. Up to this moment, the whole scintillation community is very much focused on blue scintillators. And the reason for that is that the most well-known, most frequently used light detection method, the photomultiplier tube, is mainly sensitive in the blue part of the spectrum. Silicon offers the potential to have a high quantum efficiency also at higher wavelengths. And with that knowing, we now realize that we can use also yellow or red emitting scintillators. 
At the moment, they hardly exist. But in future, I'm quite sure they will come. And this is an interesting remark to start this discussion with. So let's go to the next slide and show you, push this button, oops. Sure. I, I got it for you then, Paul. Okay, thank you, you, you have control, okay, fine. Um, the possibilities to detect scintillation light. Uh, let's give us first, let's look, have an overview here of the different methods. First of all, we have the classic photomultiplier tube. And I won't go into great details of the less frequently used methods, but the full multiplier tube is made of glass. It's relatively fragile. And because it's made of glass, it has some potassium 40 background. The signals are large. Signal to noise ratios are very good and they are quite fast. We're talking about nanosecond rise times. And also don't forget they can be made up to quite large dimensions, roughly five inch, 13 centimeter is common. The price per square centimeter is quite low. The disadvantage also for multiplier tubes is that they're sensitive to magnetic fields because there are electrons inside. When we don't shield them, they are easily deviated. PM technology is existing old technology, it's vacuum tubes, which we know the technology very well and we are very familiar with them. The silicon technology that's around for quite a long time is pin diodes. There's no amplification there. The maximum size is limited to a few centimeter, but they're very stable as a function of temperature, the gains, there's no gain, just the signals are quite stable. And um, they're also not available in larger than a few centimeters. CCDs are mainly used for high radiation fields, and I won't go into that in details. And we have average photodiodes. Those are diodes that have amplification built in. They're rather unstable as a function of temperature, relatively expensive, but still they are used in some physics experiments. But the topic today is silicon filter multipliers. And I would like to show you first a little illustration of the question. David, can I have the camera? Oh, there we are. I would like to, um, yeah, the question, I would like to, to show you the classic example of a combination of a scintillator and a formal multiplier tube. And the question is, can we do something similar where we have a silicon photomultiplier, couple this to a scintillator, and what are the properties then? And how do they compare with a classic solution? But first of all, next slide. There we are, oops, too fast. First of all, I'd like to tell you very simple, in an extremely simple way, how a silicon photomultiplier works. There have been many very complicated papers written on the subject, going into very much theoretical detail. But this is an extremely simplified explanation, which is necessary for you to understand the difference between multiplier tubes and silicon PMs. Silicon PMs are arrays of silicon microcells. They are roughly 35 by 35 micron typical. All these cells are in parallel. Every micropixel is in fact an average photodiode operating in Geiger mode with about a million gain. When one pixel hits, a, when one photon hits a pixel, it can fire and it's a fixed amount of charge. So you can imagine yourself if you have an array of all those pixels, those microcells, and you have many photons, all those signals add up. So more photons means more cells fire and more signal is generated. And that is the whole principle of scintillation detection spectrometry. Every six by six millimeter SIPM has roughly 22,000 micropixels. And this, with this method, you can understand that silicon PMs can saturate. Because depending on the number of silicon PMs you use on your scintillator, at a certain moment, all the pixels fire and it's finished. In reality, it happens already at roughly 20% of the number of photons hitting the pixels. So, the method of silicon PMs is intrinsic to an alinearity, which you can understand as long as we realize this is a phenomenon we can compensate for. Paul, could you hold on one second, please? Yeah. It looks like about seven or eight people are having problem with audio. Um, so let's, let's just do a quick uh, check here um, and see why that is. Um, 
so if if you can hear us fine, could you just put a little note in the chat box that the audio is okay? That would at least tell us that um, it, it's on the receiving end. So I see a lot of people say that it's working fine in Firefox, Safari, um, in Chrome. Uh, yeah, it looks like audio's okay in most of the common browsers. Uh, really unfortunate for the few people who are not able to hear the presentation. Um, at this point, um, we're going to continue the presentation and the people um, who are having trouble with audio, will, we will just be sure to email them a copy of the presentation at a later time. So um, let's carry on, Paul. Thank you. Okay, we go on. Okay. Yep. So the good properties of silicon PMs is actually the quantum efficiency is actually comparable to the best photomultiplier tubes. The silicon PMs, we don't speak about the real quantum efficiency, but we talk about the photon detection efficiency. That is because between the microcells, there's a little dead area. But that photo detection efficiency is actually comparable to the best photomultiplier tubes. The signals are large. The gains actually of silicon PMs and photomultiplier tubes are comparable. And the nice thing about silicon PMs is that they are insensitive to magnetic fields. You can shield for both wire tubes or magnetic fields, but when the fields become very strong, it's very difficult. So operating a PM in a Tesla field is almost impossible task. The silicon photomultiplier works fine in an extremely strong field, simply because they're not fly free flying electrons inside. Silicon PMs are small, they are compact, so we can make very rugged detectors out of them. They contain no glass, so there is no potassium background, and they operate at very low voltages. We don't have to use a high voltage generator because for a photomultiplier tube, you roughly need 600, 800 volts. In this case, we see it speak about 30 to 50 volts, something like that. Another interesting phenomenon of silicon PMs is that they don't show any hysteresis effects. And this is something that really bothers us. We want to stabilize scintillation detectors that are equipped with photomultiplier tubes. Now, some of the less ideal properties of SIPMs. At the moment, the price per square centimeter is an order of magnitude more than of photomultiplier tubes. This may change in the future, but we're not sure about that. And these silicon pixels are relatively thin. And this means they have a capacitance, which is much more than the parts inside a full mobile tube. And this means that they are by far not as fast as full mobile tubes, unless you use really small SIPMs. So for example, in positron emission tomography, people use two by two millimeter SIPMs, and there you can use a really perfect, very nice time resolution. But when we want to read out, let's say a few kilo of scintillation material, we have to use a larger number of SIPMs, and these signals are quite much slower than uh, photomobilized tubes. Another thing we have to realize is that silicon PMs are noisy. And the noise comes from the fact that those micropixels, they fire spontaneously. And this effect is very strongly temperature dependent. This is something we cannot do much about, unless that something may be improved by the manufacturers that this so-called dark current is an intrinsic thing of silicon PMs. As I said, silicon PMs have capacity. And when you use more of them on a bigger scintillator, the signal shapes depending on the size. So if you have more SIPMs on a big piece of scintillation material, the signals are slower than when you use only a few of them. And this is different from photomultiplier tubes. This has consequence for the signal processing. Vicente will talk about that. With modern digital signal processors, we can easily correct for this, but we have to realize it. And as I earlier said, um, because the number of pixels, microcells, is limited on the SIPM, there can occur a linearity in energy depending on the number of micropixels we have and the, the number of photons. Silicon PMs have a gain drift as a function of temperature. This is very well defined, and we can correct for it. And there's one other thing, silicon PMs don't like fast neutrons. 
If you're inside an accelerator and you have a lot of neutrons, let's say 12 into the 12 neutrons per square centimeter, they do damage. And it is irreversible. So this is very shortly what we have facing at the moment with the SIPM. And of course, when you considering an array of scintillation crystals, like I showed there in the, in the picture, it's obvious you're using silicon PM arrays. For example, at the leading out wave and shifting fibers. But when taking all these considerations and considering all the pros and cons, we can conclude that silk MPMs can be very well used to develop an entire new generation of scintillation detectors with quite unique properties. Like I showed you, no magnetic field sensitivity, compactness, low voltage, etc. We can use temperature compensated bias generators, like you see, you see there in the left picture. That's a small device that actually produces the 25 volts or 30 volts um, for the bias of the SIPM. Measure the temperature and adjust the bias, the, the gain, to keep it constant. Because this gain is so well defined. And in the curve at the right bottom, you see what happens when you don't correct for this gain drift and when you do correct for it. This small module we incorporate in many of our designs. It does not correct for the gain change of the device due to the crystal. It only corrects the light detector, the silicon PM. So if, for example, you're reading out crystal like BGO, has a very strong temperature dependence, you'll see the dependence of the crystal still in the response of the sensor. So this new generation of detectors, we actually have a picture here. Um, this is an example of five by five centimeter, two inch by two inch devices, scintillators, all read out with silicon PMs. At the bottom, you see the spectra measured with them. And for most of you, they will look extremely familiar to what you see with classic photomultiplier tubes. This is cesium 662 a frequently used nuclide. You see the PhotoPeak, Compton Edge, the 30 keV X-rays. At the right, you see an americium spectrum with 60 keV and some lower energies there below it. But we also see the noise coming up there, rising steeply at roughly 10 keV. And this is a lot more than with a photomultiplier tube. We can actually design many sensors with many shapes and configurations. This is a cesium iodide crystal, as I said. Silicon PMs are well sensitive in the yellow part of the spectrum. So cesium iodide, an extremely strong scintillator, we can equip, equip extremely well with a silicon PM array and it will give a quite nice resolution of six and a half percent, which is not bad for this crystal. And at the bottom, you'll see a cerium bromide, high resolution detector, giving you a 4% energy resolution. And this is quite comparable to that of a photomultiplier tube. Did you there have more? Camera, you... okay. Can I have the camera, David? Yeah. Nice. yeah. yeah. So, um, Here's an example of a scintillation detector consisting of a crystal, a classic photomultiplier tube, equipped with a digital base, bright spec base. And actually, we have to compare it when in size to a two inch by two inch SIPM detector, complete with the ADC, this kind of size. Much smaller, much more compact. Can you so, hold those both up again side by side, Paul? Yeah, the cameras are moving this a little. One, this one. A little Yep, that's an MCA with the detector. It's an MCA with the SIPM, complete spectroscopic system. And this yeah. is the system with full multiplier tube. Previous and digital, style. Digital yep. base. Like it shows the difference in, in dimension. That's another example of a PMT solution. Yep. 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 Okay, the, the video is a little s slower than you. So that's why I wanted to make sure everybody had a chance to see that. Okay. Yeah, huge, thank you. huge difference. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, some more spectra of uh, the new generation scintillation detectors with SIPMs. At the left top, you see a BGO spectrum, and BGO is a scintillator that emits less photons than, uh, for example, sodium iodide, which means that the noise level of those probes is much higher than uh, with a full multiplier tube. 
So the noise level with BGO is roughly 50 keV, 40, and that is much higher than with a phone multiplier. At the bottom, bright scintillator, cerium bromide, again, X rays, 662 keV. But when you look to the right, to the thorium spectrum, you see they look very familiar to you. There is no alienarity in these, uh, these spectra and uh, allows you actually to, to use these detectors the same as you do with classic photomultiplier tube based modules. Well, I mentioned earlier that um, photomultiplier tubes per square centimeter are less expensive than SIPMs. So we try to limit the number of SIPMs on our scintillators as much as possible to limit the cost, but also to limit the noise. Because as I said, SIPMs are noisy. So we have to use as little as possible on them. At the top, you see the famous equation for the energy resolution of a scintillation detector. At the top functionality, there's the statistics and there is the inhomogeneity in the crystal. And we have to realize that um, in SIPM detectors, um, we have less photons actually, and we do not cover the entire crystal surface with SIPMs. So the energy resolution at low energies is definitely worse than that with a photomultiplier solution. So at the bottom, you see, for example, an americium spectrum, two inch by two inch crystal with a photomultiplier tube, where you have roughly 10% resolution. But if we use an SIPM solution, it's roughly 18%. And it's actually, um, we cannot improve much. We can increase the number of SIPMs, but the module becomes more expensive, but also the noise increases. So this is definitely a disadvantage of SIPM scintillation detectors, that at low energies, the resolution is not as good as a photomultiplier tube. But in many applications, you don't really need this. Um, and at high energies, there's not really much difference. We can make many different configurations with SIPMs. For example, here you see a well detector, a scintillation crystal with a hole in it to measure samples. On the right, you see a scope image. Like I earlier said, the gains of SIPMs are quite large, comparable to photomultiplier tubes. And at the bottom, you see spectra from americium, iodine, and cesium measured in the well. Again, I'd like to remind you, these spectra are all measured at 23 degrees centigrade. As soon as we go to a real warm environment, 50 degrees, the noise level increases dramatically. And we are not able on larger size crystals to see iodine above the noise. This is definitely a drawback. We have to consider very carefully what is the energy, what is the temperature I'm using my scintillation component. But also alpha beta detectors, contamination monitors, we can equip with SIPMs. Here you see a design consisting of a zinc sulfide screen with a plastic scintillator and a light guide read out by a single SIPM and temperature compensated bias generator. You see the alpha spectrum to the left, the chlorine beta spectrum to the right. And as a comparison, I show the chlorine beta spectrum with the photomultiplier tube. So the bottom two pictures is right the photomultiplier, left the SIPM. You see it is quite comparable. The noise level is about 35 keV beta energy. And also the different pulse shapes because the plastic scintillator is much faster and the zinc sulfide are retained in this particular configuration with the amplifier as a new generation probe. So the possibilities are quite endless. Now let's summarize a little the drawbacks and the for, for mode of SIPMs. In larger scintillators, we need more SIPMs to collect the light. And more SIPMs means slower signals. And this has, a has an effect on the signal processing, which we have to look very carefully at. If we use more SIPMs on the single scintillator, we increase the noise. And the optimum is not always obvious. And don't forget, the noise increases fivefold from 20 to 60 degrees centigrade. So, concluding, to detect a small amount of photons from a larger scintillator is problematic with SIPMs. The noise level in KEV from low-intensity scintillators, for example, BGO, is quite large. 
And increasing the number of SIPMs doesn't help. But fast scintillators allow small digital shaping times and this positively improves the single noise ratio. And again, at high temperatures, the noise level in KEV is relatively high. But as I've showed you today, in balance, the recent advances in SIPM technology allows us to generate many different configurations of scintillation probes and components using these very interesting devices. And we can get spectrum out of them that are quite comparable to photomultiplier tubes. But we have to realize what the limitations are in the use of these devices. Okay. That's uh, excellent, uh, Paul. That's a, I know there are a lot of questions popping up in the chat, but we are going to postpone the questions till the end okay. uh, and, and jump right into the electronics and spectroscopy software uh, with Vincent. Okay. Take it away. Okay. Uh, uh, good evening. Good morning. I don't know uh, to everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Vincent, so I come from Braspec. Uh, it's a small, relatively small company in Belgium. And we do spectroscopy uh, instrumentation and software. So this is a, a small presentation uh, together with Paul about the silicon PMs. Uh, and I will not repeat what Paul already uh, very nicely said that uh, there is some advantages of uh, silicon PMs based scintillators like uh, yeah, they are very compact uh, you don't need much uh, high voltage uh, bias your power consumption is very low uh, they have very high gain uh, this is probably one of the most in, uh, important one they are insensitive to magnetic fields so that's why a lot of research uh, came first from the medical field because uh, with these uh, devices you can build the dream machine of any doctor so you can combine nuclear magnetic uh, resonance instruments with uh, PET or CAT scans uh, and still there is a lot of research going in that direction and uh, uh, however there are a few challenging aspects uh, for spectrometry which uh, already Paul mentioned is that they come with a finite size or arrangements. So for instance, uh, a four by four channels, array might cover only three by three square millimeters. So the more, so if you want a, a very good energy resolution, you have to arrange several of these arrays in the uh, uh, scintillator and then you increase eventually the noise and also what is more important, the capacitancy, the overall capacitancy. Um, uh, then your pulses become too long and you lose capabilities at high count rate. Um, also the energy resolution depends very much uh, of the stability of the bias, uh, high voltage. So if there is no um, very, precise uh, high voltage bias, uh, you will suffer of this. Uh, and the other drawback is that they have uh, uh, non-linearity, especially at high gamma ray uh, emissions. Uh, this is coming because of the finite number of pixels that you might have in per square millimeter. And obviously you saturate for higher uh, energies. Uh, your arrays. This is a, a very simple example of the two signals. On the left side, you have a standard PMT input signal to the electronics, uh, so to the pulse processing. And on the right side, you have uh, more or less a fair comparison uh, from a silicon PM, not the same size of the scintillator. Uh, with no special algorithm or anything. So you can see that on the right side is pretty noisy. The baseline is totally corrupt. And the decay is not really exponential. So you have to apply different uh, models there to, uh, to process this signal. 
Perhaps one of the best example, uh, and here I am referring to an external work, uh, work published by a, a Polish group uh, in 2017, uh, where they fired a laser uh, to several scintillators that had uh, silicon arrays uh, coupled to them. And as you can see here on the left side, uh, the cerium bromide, and I took only as an example two of them, and on the right side, uh, cesium iodine. Uh, so you could see that by placing more uh, silicon arrays in order to maintain the energy resolution, the cerium bromide lost the capabilities of high count rates. So cerium bromide is a very fast scintillator, so it's nine. Uh, 16 nanosecond decay time. And you can see here that by putting too many arrays on the cerium bromide, it makes 10 times slower the cerium bromide. And so we are again in the trade off uh, situation where you have to, for large scintillators uh, coupled to silicon PMs, you have to decide. Uh, whether you will go for energy resolution or high count rates. So how digital processing works. So because of all of these uh, problems, uh, uh, our advice is that you, you need a, a full feature uh, uh, digital processor. And I explain a little bit here how digital processing works. Uh, it's a very simple, uh, let's say, diagram, but still it explains how the pulses are analyzed. So to the tail pulse, which uh, is described here on the, on the figure A, um, you apply uh, a digital filter, infinite in in input response, and then you get an step function. And this uh, step uh, pulse, you delay it, and then you subtract the two of them, getting the signal which is in D. Uh, that signal you delay it again uh, with respect to the falling H, and then you get two signals, D and E, which you uh, sum up, uh, or subtract, sorry, and then uh, you integrate them and you get the famous trapezoidal signal, which uh, is symmetrical in the time domain. So this is basically more or less what all the uh, digital pulse processes are doing. And although I put it in a very si simplistic way, um, we use, of course, uh, some other algorithms, but basically are all based on, on this uh, approach. And is uh, they then you work with this uh, trapezoidal signal, which is much much easier to work with, and is very representative to the amount of charges that were collected uh, from the detector. The problem here is that this is uh, totally ideal, ide idealistic. So in the real world, your signals are not infinite, uh, uh, rich in the amplitude. So you get kind of um, curve or more smooth uh, reaching your, your amplitude. And the point here is that you need to select the rise time and the flat top uh, in such a way that they, they affect, they get the signal output, the digital signal out output gets uh, less affected by these uh, deviations from, from the ideal pulse. As you can see also here, the delays are basically the rise time and the flat top. So by choosing, for instance, in this case on the right side, uh, a longer uh, flat top, we could integrate all the charges and not lose any charge in the input, input pulse. So that's why for this, uh, scintillation, scintillation based, uh, sorry, uh, uh, silicon PM based scintillators, we design an special MCA, which uh, is, although it's miniature, um, so it's very small size, you can see here in the picture compared to a two euro uh, coin, 
uh, is still a full feature MCA. So for instance, you have different modes of acquisition like a pulse height analysis or the standard spectrum measurement, but also you have a multi-channel scaling acquisition mode. You have a, a, a very wide amplification factor from one to 16, so you can arrange your energy range uh, nicely. Uh, we apply different advanced algorithms for treat the baseline noise, uh, which are uh, very prominent with SIPEMS. Uh, and uh, we also use a very low ripple um, uh, powers to power the preamplifier, which is included in the, in the scintillator. The device can be connected uh, to a PC using the USB for data and power um, communication. And on the digital unit, we use a flash ABC with 25 megahertz, uh, mega sample per second, uh, each uh, 12 bits, uh, 40 megahertz CPU, 50 megahertz DPP. And there you can get uh, rise times. You can choose your own rise times from 0 0.1 to 12 or flat tops from 0 0.1 to 8. Uh, you can go up to 4K channels, uh, each uh, 32 bits depth. You also have, if you see on the right side, you have the, the pictures of the front and back panel. And you have also a GPI GPIO port, which you can program. And it usually consumes uh, 1 watt, 1.1 watt. These are different arrangements. I probably can show you one of the, how the MCA looks like. So it's about this size. So that you have a pers perspective is, uh, is a pen. I also have an audio cookie. So everybody knows an audio, so. <laughs> You have very small hands, <laughs> so I can see the how small the device is. Yeah, it's supposed to be a joke. Um, so these are the different arrangements. Uh, there is something we we didn't probably stress here. Uh, there is a advantage of silicon PMs uh, scintillator is that you can also make let's say not standard arrangements, like uh, we always work with a cubic or, or let's say round uh, scintillators. With, uh, with silicon PMs, you have the advantage of creating other types, other forms, which is sometimes uh, quite nice. Uh, for for our electronics, we provide also an SDK, so a software development kit where you can easily interface using any kind of development environment like C++, Python, uh, you name it. And it's also multi-platform, so you can have it in Windows, both 32 or 64 bits, uh, Linux, SDK, uh, it's also included with uh, for both for uh, 80, for Intel processors and also ARM processors, so you can run it on a Raspberry Pi. And we also have Android. I have it here, but uh, it doesn't look very well in the camera. Um, and it's anyway the phone is uh, the battery is gone. So. Uh, but you have the photo here, which uh, you can just plug it into, into your mobile phone or tablet and have the device interfaced. Okay. Additionally, we can provide the, a very uh, complete and full feature gamma ray spectroscopy uh, software, which is a multi-document, so you can have different spectrum at the same time. Uh, multi-hardware control, meaning concurrently you can control several MCAs at the same time. And very important is a multi-platform, so you can run it in Windows, uh, Mac OS, or Linux. With this software, you are able to obviously resolve any kind of interference. So here you see uh, the Varium 133 complex multiplet 
how nicely it's resolved. And this spectrum was measured with this pen type uh, cerium bromide detector. Um, and, uh, was very good. This is, uh, although Paul say that low energies is sometimes problematic, we got very good results with the, uh, the standard sodium iodine uh, coupled with this uh, silicon PM on the americium um, uh, energy region. We could go as low as uh, americium X-ray lines. Um, quite okay. This uh, cesium iodine, one of, one of my favorites, because you might get better energy resolutions than uh, with the standard PMTs. And here, uh, as you can see, we got 7.8 on cesium. Now, when, when all of this uh, silicon PM uh, started, uh, we started to work with psionics, and of course we didn't believe them, so we tried to, uh, to test down and drill all of these uh, uh, new devices. And this is something, uh, some results uh, from our test that you can see here, and I'm going to share it with you. Uh, so we built a kind of an environmental chamber, not very professional, just a homemade, let's say. And we changed temperatures more or less from zero uh, degrees to 20 uh, degrees. So here you can see it on the right side axis, the temperature. This is a double plot uh, uh, figure. And uh, we monitor the food with a maximum of uh, cesium all over the energies. And as you can see, the gain stabilization built in psionics uh, devices is quite nice. It, uh, it has only a standard deviation of 0.1%. Uh, Below, you have the COBOL 57 follow-up for not with temperature changes, but let's say with normal office or laboratory um, temperatures. And you can see that all the plots, all the, the values are within the two sigma. Um, bands of deviation. Then we try the cesium bromide at high camp rate, or let's say rel relatively high camp rate, and we we use technetium produced in a in a radiopharmaceutical factory, and we could reach uh, ICRs of uh, 600 kilocounts per second with a reasonable spectrum quality. And here you can see it on the on the left side uh, plot, and on the right side plot you see uh, we monitor the peak centroid, so the the peak shifting on these devices, and we were astonished. So it was only shifting two channels uh, from let's say from maximum value to minimum value for a whole range of up to six hundred kilocounts. So uh, perhaps the conclusion here is that uh, what we will advise is that you use uh, a full feature uh, digital signal processor when you deal with silicon PMs scintillators because you might get uh, different signals uh, coming to your, to your digitizer. And as well, we recommend, of course, uh, a good uh, gamma ray spectrum analysis. Uh, back to you. Yep. Thank you, Vincent. That's very uh, informative and in offering some of the latest advancements clearly in uh, the electronic side of this industry. A um, couple quick reminders. Uh, we do have the Academy. I think we talked about a little bit, but not everybody uh, saw that. That's on our website. Uh, these are free courses. Uh, they're more entry level, but they cover radiation detection, custom scintillators. Um, you can register on those courses uh, and take them at your own pace. They have some tests and some certificates. They're also great for interns. If you have summer interns working in your labs, uh, we'd like to encourage you to uh, take a look at the Academy. Um, also, white papers and literature are downloadable. It's a little hard to read there, but there's the, the company websites, Berkeley Nucleonics, uh, Psionics, and BrightSpec. We'll provide that information too. Uh, BNC has been, uh, as I mentioned, at this a long time, and, and we have a wide range of products, and 
and uh, tackle some of the toughest requirements. Um, I, I'm sorry we're not able to host any visits. We we enjoy this this forum. I did take a picture of one of our test departments. So there's some of our guys in the back, uh, Edgar and Dax, some of our engineers who are working on signal generators right now. Um, but uh, let me, we're going to wrap up here and get into Q&A in just a second. Um, of course, there's all the social links too. So when we have these webinars or when we post videos of these webinars and new material online, either on our YouTube channel or on our website, we always do a, a social post as well. So uh, be sure to uh, subscribe, link, uh, follow, do whatever you, it works for you so that you get notified of those updates. And uh, I think that kind of concludes the technical portion of our uh, talk. So um, there's a lot of questions here, Paul. Do you want to, and, and, and Vincent, do you want to, um, uh, let's see, how do you want to go, go quickly through it? Yeah, we'll just kind of do some. If, if, you, if you read it, if you, you pick questions, I'll go David, as quickly uh, as I can here. Let's do that. We'll, right. we'll keep it quick and short. Um, so let me start with. I see a last question coming up with the maximum count rate using SIPMs. Well, I think uh, that uh, Vicente answered that already. It depends, of course, on the simulator also. But if you're talking about uh, maximum count rates, we have operated SIPMs uh, with fast scintillators up to uh, 600 kilohertz, close to a megahertz. Yeah. Uh when we use cilium bromides, which are probably one of the fastest, it's a 60 yeah. nanosecond, with very small amount of sipping, uh, so like the pendrive I show there, uh, oh, yeah. we could reach uh, 600, a little bit more, but then the spectrum started to deteriorate. So 600 kilocounts yeah. incoming count rate, incoming count rate, okay? Uh, throughput was something like uh, 400. Is 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 some you can see it on the on the slide. Uh, also, you started to see noise in the peaks and uh, and some artifacts like uh, too much sun peak and and so on. Okay, but as as, uh, as Paul say, it depends very very much of the type of uh, scintillator that you will use and the arrangement. Of the SIP and that are with the, with that scintillator. Got it. Uh, question here from Abram: Is it uh, expected in the future or currently possible to see SIPM coupled with Peltier thermocouplers to stabilize the SIPM temperature? Yeah, I, I can answer that. Some to tell something about that question. It's it's definitely an option to cool SIPMs, but it requires additional electronics, and we didn't venture in that direction yet because it makes life a little complicated, but it's definitely possible because SIPMs by themselves have very little heat capacity, although you couple them, of course, to the scintillator. And when you want to detect gamma rays, you may need a scintillator with a seizable mass. So in the end, you also need to cool the scintillator. Um, but it is certainly a possibility. Thank you. And this helps, of course, helps, of course, yeah. in limiting this, uh, this noise increase at elevated temperatures. Great. Paul, question here from David. Are the baseline restoration techniques applied in the software, actually for Vincent, are the baseline restoration techniques applied in software during processing or integrated into the device? No, it's integrated into the device. Thank you. Uh, Sue Ann asks, what's the maximum event rate achievable for the Topaz SIPM MCA with 4,096 channels? Uh, uh, we just spoke about it. Uh, is, uh, does she mean uh, incoming count rate, or it depends much of of the scintillator? Okay. Uh, of course, you have the you have the ideal. Uh, let's say uh, so. We run we run this with the twenty five megahertz. So it's one over twenty five megahertz. So uh, there is a zero twenty five. So it's a uh, half a million, million. Half a million. Okay, um, Paul, what's your take on covering the surface not exposed to SIPMs with a reflector, like Teflon? Well, of course. Yeah, sure. That is, of course, the technology one uses. 
if you're only covering part of the scintillator with SIPM, you cover the rest as a reflector. But there is a limit what you can do in the in reflecting the light back into the scintillator. So it's not an optimum solution, but that's what we do, of course. Yes. Okay. Uh, Edward asks, can we speak to the readout electronics for determining SIPM response positioning? Uh, no. We uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, the on the readout electronics, can we use that to determine the SIPM response position? Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, Paul, I mean, we read all the charges coming from the from the preamplifier, and the preamplifier. No, no, you can you can of course you you can of course use an array of SIPMs and read them all out individually. Like for example, we have this uh, five by five centimeter array of. Uh, of SIPM modules, and you can read all the SIPM files separately, then you can deduct the position if you have a thin crystal. This is definitely done already. Yeah, but it's then you need uh, as many MCAs as array yes, separate. Yes, yes, you need, you, need, you need 64 channels, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it's yeah. a different kind of electronics. But those kind of electronics is available from people who design electronics for medical devices, for pet scanners, for example. Yeah. Okay. Rachel asks, uh, I noticed on the data sheet for SIPM we've been using the characteristics versus overvoltage start at an overvoltage of one volt. Is there a reason not to run below this? Um, no, there's no reason. Uh, the only thing is that if you increase the overvoltage on a SIPM, the PDE increases, so it's better to run it at uh, not too low overvoltage. On the other hand, if the overvoltage is too high, you run into saturation. So it's a compromise. But uh, actually, we run roughly at two and a half volt overvoltage okay. on 25 or three volt overvoltage, some 24, 25 volt breakdown. Some, some of these questions, frankly, are a little technical and a little bit uh, application specific. So I know that I've not read and an we have not answered everybody's questions. We will come back to you one on one for some of these. Um, I, I see one question there from Mittal Zalivadia. Yeah. That's the temperature compensation method. We, we do it purely on the hardware way. So we know the characteristic of a SIPM, we measure the temperature and control the over voltage. So it's not a lookup table, it's a purely analog way. Okay, good. Um, great, well, like I said, we'll come back. There's still a few uh, little sort of esoteric questions in there we will come back to. I'm gonna, uh, You've given us all, a lot of time today. Um, we've been excited to host this event. Uh, we're going to end on time. We're going to end five minutes early. Um, I know I uh, appreciate uh, Paul and Vincent's time as well. And Mia, thank you again for running the back end and making sure that everybody's questions get answered. Everybody gets the material that's required. And uh, for those of you who are uh, in the uh, have tomorrow off, have a great weekend. Um, I think we can conclude. Sound okay? Okay. 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 Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.